going on guys welcome back to another warrior wednesday where we discuss relevant topics designed to make you a better warrior today's topic of conversation is going to be operating alone in an austere environment one thing i broke alone sounds freaking cool doesn't it it is i mean it's cool guy stuff and um i was lucky enough to go through um <clears throat> some training on this back in the day um not connected to any agency or anything like that, but I'll leave it at that. And uh, there's kind of two aspects of this. There is what you learn in the classroom and learn in training, and then there's what you learn actually going and doing it. And they can be connected, but totally separate at the same time. And I think that's the way it is with most things is there's training and there's classroom work, and then there's actual practical experience. That's why when you go to apply for jobs in any field, doesn't have to be the ta tactical field, um, <clears throat> they always want <clears throat> practical experience. They, they, they seem to prioritize experience versus classroom training or cer certificates or degrees, rightly so. So we're going to jump into this. Um, it's, it's pretty cool. Now, before we get going i've got a fuck stuff he knows guys um yet again i've been traveling for the past about month and a half in some third world ass freaking countries and the pollution out in this part of the world can be pretty brutal um so here i am again um with a stuff he knows but i'm going to attempt to not blow my nose or anything while i'm on cameras don't worry about it as we would say back where i'm from um <clears throat> So let's jump into this, all right? If you're still with me, chances are you're you're fairly interested in this topic. It's kind of a fascinating topic. Operating alone in an austere environment. This is something that is specialized information that is more taught by experience than training. However, there is plenty of training that we go through to enhance your survivability. This intelligent option will increase your survivability when- Operating alone in an austere environment is a flashy clickbait type of phrase, but- Let's examine what this actually really means for most of us, because most of us um, aren't doing that. <laughs> you know, most of us aren't like traveling around by ourselves in third world countries like some guys and girls love it. Some girls, including me, like some guys and girls thrive in this in this weird environment where you're like alone in a weird hostile place and like. You have to try to blend in the best you can. It's thrilling. It's exhilarating, exhilarating. Ex exhilarating i think that's the term i hope so um <clears throat> but a lot of people don't want to do that right so this could mean a lot of other things as well um what what could well tell me what it means i'll tell you don't worry about it um it could be that you're traveling or living someplace um that's not 100 percent safe unsupported by a team or minimally supported by a team this could be like hey you move to a new area for work um and it's like not the greatest area, right? You haven't really made any friends yet. Maybe you haven't even started your job yet. You're just kind of out there alone. And you're like, fuck, I'm in kind of like, like I might be on the outskirts of the ghetto right now, or I might actually be in the ghetto right now. Like, this is not a great place. Maybe you're traveling for work, right? Um, I used to have, when I was, we, when I used to work as a private investigator, I would work alone in very bad parts of, you know, <laughs> of uh, the East Coast. And it was, um, Sometimes it was like, oh, man, I'm the only white guy around for miles. I've gotten used to that, uh, you know, um, but it's again, that's the type of thing you have to get used to. And you have to learn kind of ways to operate that. And we'll get into this, but you have to learn how to blend in without blending it at all. And uh, this okay, could. Wow. I just stuttered like hell on that. This could also mean, hey, you are solo traveling. You're in different parts of the world and uh you're, you're doing that, right? And that's a great, it's a great opportunity for growth, frankly speaking. Um, there could be a lot of other things. Maybe you do travel intrastate or around your state, a couple of other states around for work. Maybe you do repair work or whatever it is, and you have to go into some like shitty parts of town. Um, there is another, there is another thing to be said for that, or this, there is something to be said for that. We have to have kind of a, a knowledge of <clears throat> what type of things we need to do to make sure that we do enhance our survivability. Love that term. So there are three main criteria that we look at and that we classify things as, um, and that would be low, medium, and high-risk areas. So a low-risk area, let's just say 
We're traveling, you know, intrastate or intracountry. Low risk area is this freaking suburbs, dude. Like nothing happens. Dude. Like everything's safe. It's just housewives and like kids and and professionals. Um, a medium risk area could be like maybe again you're on the outskirts of like a bad area or in the city, right? Like in the city center of Manhattan or Chicago or London or whatever, right? Like it's 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 not it's probably nothing's gonna happen, but there's a chance, right? And then obviously a high risk area would be like the shitty parts of town that like all the like immigrants move to and like no one like there's gangs and like it's a bad area, right? Like that that would be a high risk area. And again, um, if we're talking internationally, obviously that could be, you know, a country like um Iraq or Afghanistan or anywhere, you know, um in the in the Levant right now, Israel, um Palestine, like that would all be extremely high risk areas. A medium risk area would be somewhere like um maybe India or Jordan. I wouldn't even classify Jordan as a medium risk, but we could say that. Um, you know, places like this that are like, eh, something could potentially happen, but probably not. And then obviously a low risk country would be like the freaking Bahamas, right? We're like, <laughs> dude, you're fine. Like it's an island, there's nothing's gonna happen, dude. Like it's super safe. Believe it or not, there's a lot of um <clears throat> low risk countries also in the Middle East. There's a lot of low risk countries in um Asia. That you know, Americans don't typically kind of feel that way, but it, it, it's very low risk, it's very safe. Um a lot of the work that we want to do regarding setting ourselves up for success is typically started before we get there. And I say started before we get there, because in my experience, when I was going through a lot of the training that I went through, they said, all the work is done before you go. But in reality, no, the work is started before you go. And it's usually finished while you're already there, while you've got boots on the ground. And sometimes you're lucky enough to have um, a team that you're relieving or a person that you're relieving and a lot of that information that they've acquired while they're over there can be passed on to you. And again, this could be also, <laughs> for example, the work that I used to do as a PI. Um, this could be, hey, another PI that you're coming in and he says, dude, I've been to that area before. Just, you know, watch out for that and that. And then this is a good place to set up over here and blah, blah, blah. So he's passing on his personal experience to you. But there's nothing like in country or on location personal experience because you can sit there on google maps and uh, all the open source channels that you're going to want to go through and you can get a complete picture in your head of what's going to what it's going to be like over there and you can get over there and it's not like that at all so <clears throat> a lot of the times it's better to have personal experience and that's why i say if you are truly operating alone with no team or very minimal team then a lot of the times you're going to start your research before you go and then finish it while you are there. For example, um, site selection. Site selection, again, could be, um, for an example, where where's the building that I'm going to do this repair plumbing work or whatever, right? Or where is the location where I want to set up my initial surveillance? It's the Working as a PI, for example, or solo traveling or traveling in general. Hey, what's what's the hostel or hotel that I want to stay at? Like, why do I want to stay there? What's what's the area? Is is there you know my basic needs? Restaurants, cafes, laundry, coffee, whatever, whatever it is. Is there something in walking distance? Like all of this stuff that you want to know. Where's the tourist attractions? This and that. Um, where is the location of the actual site that I want to set up? So that's something that's important, and we're going to do that by um, not only going on you know, some type of Google Maps or Apple Maps or whatever it is, probably both, and um, not only getting like a satellite view, but also going online, doing our research on there. Um, there's different forums we can go to if we're traveling or whatever, and uh, figure out other people's experience and try to get, get a complete picture or a, as a complete of a picture as we can and piece it all together. We're going to want to open like some type of Word document probably and actually like write all our notes down and try to really get as a complete of a picture as we can um, about our site selection. Then we move on to area and route mapping. So again, especially if we are driving or if we are traveling through the area in any type of regular regularity, 
um, we want to get a route map route map done. Um, we kind of want to know, hey, is there places that I don't want to drive through? Like, is there any reason I don't want to take this route, but I want to take this route? If this route is unavailable to me, can I take this route over here? Usually we say uh, primary, secondary, tertiary routes is a good thing to have mapped out already. And again, we can map that out all we want, but when we get there, it might be completely different. We might say online or you know on our open source research, hey, this is a great route right here. But then we get there and we say, that's the worst route. Like this one over here is actually way better. So that's going to be our primary. We need to switch to an alternate. We can take this one. And then if we really need a tertiary route, here's this available to us. But a lot of the times it just takes getting in country or getting you know, on site <clears throat> to actually figure out the routes. And the area mapping again is, okay, like what's, what's around me? Um, is there a near a near like police station or hospital or something that I can like go to if I need to what like where where's the basic things that I need is there a gas station if I'm driving like this these types of things we want to know again before we go and again it will change or can change once we get there but we want to have at least something set up for ourselves to set ourselves up for maximum success and uh you know if this comes into some type of thing where you know, I might want to change up my roots every now and again, just to like, just to be safe, right? Well, this is a good, this is a good way to at least set ourselves up for success that way too. So local customs, culture, language, and currency is something that um, it's absolutely essential to look at. So local customs, this is something you want to have an idea about before you go. That way, once you land at the airport, let me tell you this from personal experience, a lot of personal experience, landing in a like foreign airport, especially a third world ass airport, fucking stressful experience. So you want to, you want to know like basic customs, especially crossing borders, dude. Like you want to know if, you know, for example, like giving something with your left hand in some places is just like, from my experience, it's never going to be, people aren't ever going to be like the fuck, like, but they will, it's better to give it with your right hand. Right. I'll put it to you like that. Like in some countries, if you say, okay, <laughs> you don't want to say that. Right. So, um, cause this can mean like, a few different things, but one of the things it can mean is like, you're an asshole or I'll fuck you in the ass. Like, don't like, you want to know about those things before you get there just to minimize any like misunderstandings. Um, So customs and cultural things, you want to know as much as you can kind of before you get there. The language, I always say, learn like a few phrases, right? Learn like, excuse me, sorry. um, Hi, how are you? Thank you. Um, You're welcome. Like these, these, basic types of things that you can use right away to communicate with people. Very, very helpful, but don't, don't stress yourself out by going overboard. If you learn five or 10 different things, you're well ahead of the game. Everything else will come and you will start learning the language um, as you, as you're there more, as you, as you're living there. Um, currency, <laughs> extremely important to know before you get there, right? Before you get there, because again, Haggling for a taxi cab is something that's commonly done in a lot of areas in the world. I mean, yeah, you can like let yourself get ripped off, but why would you, right? Like I work for my money and so do you. Like no one's entitled to rip you off for your money just because you're, you know, US dollar or, you know, British pound or euro, or whatever goes further. Like don't let these people rip you off. It's they'll respect you more if you haggle and you have to. So knowing kind of like, oh, a hundred you know, uh, rupees in this currency is actually one US dollar. That That's very helpful to know. And so knowing that type of thing, the conversion rate and all of that before you get the fuck over there is pretty essential. Um, So that would kind of be, just looking at my notes here, um, local customs, culture, language, and currency. Now, another thing that we want to take in to account is uh, medical and emergency contingencies. And I, I briefly mentioned about like, well, where's the nearest hospital? Like, this is something that you want to know. Trust me, it's something you want to know, especially when you are traveling um, in an austere environment where the possibility is there that something will happen. Not only do you want to know like, where's the nearest hospital? You want to know like, where is the best hospital for me, right? Because I can tell you this, um, in some places they'll have like two hospitals, right? Like there'll be like the government hospital for the people and then like the private hospital and nine times out of 10 in a freaking shitty place, you don't want to be at the government hospital. Like you want to be the private hospital. Another thing is definitely consider getting 
if you are going overseas. Traveler's insurance, traveler's medical insurance, and traveler's insurance. This will literally save you so much money. Like, do it. Trust trust me. Trust me. Do it. It is worth it. <laughs> um, You're going to want to know where that private hospital is. You're going to want to try to find out, like, hey, do, like, do they speak my language there? Like, and, like... Do they speak enough of it? Like, is it the type of place where even the hospital, the private hospital is dirty as fuck and I like, I want to avoid it? If that's the case, well, then maybe you want to like, see if you can figure out alternate medical advice. Maybe you can get that from an app, travel app, medical travel app, where you have a doctor that you can do remote stuff with. You might not be able to like prescribe you medication over there. But again, in a lot of these places, you can simply walk into the pharmacy and say, I want this. Um and it's not a problem. So, and then obviously uh, other emergency contingencies as well. Like, can I can I go to the police or are they going to fuck with me more if I go and talk to them, right? Like I've, I've again, been in places where I'm not going to the police if I get pickpocketed, man. Like it's, it's just like, it's more of a hassle. They'll probably want money from you just from fucking talking to them. Um, they're, they they might simply say see a white or a, a brown person that doesn't look like them and say, oh, they don't even speak my language. Um, I'm going to find something to fuck with them and bust them on. And if they give me money, I'll let them go. Like very common, honestly, and unfortunate, but it's the way it is. So maybe having other type of emergency contingencies that you can, you can work with. And um, there are services that you can use if you are truly operating alone where you can call them and say, I need to get the fuck out of the country, like, help me. Um, and they will help you. And um, not only emergency medical evacuations, but other type of emergency evacuations as well are, are possible. Um, and <clears throat> simply also uh, putting together a plan, like, oh, shit, man, like, how far am I away from a border? Or many, many other things we have to take into account. Um and I can do a more detailed video about these things if I get enough requests for it. I doubt I will because, again, this is not the type of thing that most people do. But we can we can talk about it more. But I'm going to leave it at that um, for now as far as the emergency contingencies go. So another thing <clears throat> regarding that would be legal need to knows. So, for example, um, what can I bring into this country? What can I not? bring into this country or this part of town or this state, right? So um, bringing it back stateside, because I know a lot of Americans watch this channel. Like, can I bring my CCW pistol into this state? Because I'm telling you this, like, I grew up in Jersey. And if you bring your legal CCW pistol into Jersey, you're fucking going to jail for two to three years, minimum mandatory. Done. You're a felon. So doesn't matter how many, like, CCW permits you have, from how many other states like you don't bring them into certain states, right? So that's a very important legal thing to know. And then we bring it to like overseas travel. Like I, uh, I was in, I was in, uh, I'm going to try to leave the names of the countries out for right now, but I was in one place and I went in with a nice watch and I had a little bit of jewelry with me and they saw the nice jewelry and they basically robbed me <laughs> and they took, uh, a lot of us currency from me. They, they, you go through the border, the you get your passport stamped, and then you have to go through another x-ray to even get in, you know, through customs, right? Everybody goes through the x-ray. So I was going through the x-ray. They saw I had some, uh, you know, a nice watch and some U.S. currency. And so they basically pulled me aside and they said, you're going to give us a fine because you're not allowed to give uh, bring this jewelry in. Um, so you can either... But they didn't, there was no options. <laughs> I got surrounded by like six uniformed soldiers and they were like, you're going to give us a fine. You pay the fine. And so um, if I had known about that, maybe I would have made arrangements to not bring that nice jewelry in, right? Maybe I would have made arrangements to hide my cash better or whatever, right? So another like legal need to know, like, can you, can, what, can you carry a knife in this country? Like, because a lot of countries, if you carry a knife, dude, like you're fucked. If they catch you with that, you're going to some like bad, bad jail. <laughs> it's like, by the way, your embassy will not and cannot help you when you get in trouble overseas. They're not going to help you. The most they can do is give you like legal advice. <laughs> and generally that's like somebody eventually comes down and they're like, oh yeah, you're pretty fucked, man. <laughs> 
we'll let your family know. That's like what happens. So yeah, I know. Like you really need to know about that stuff. That's why I never carry a weapon overseas ever. Anything. Um, the most I'll carry a pen. And we can talk more about carrying a pen. Um, there's there's some things you need to know about that as well. Like don't carry a pen that's unique in any way. Because if you needed to use it, wipe it and throw it out, make sure it's a pen that's commonly found in that area, right? Something still that's sturdy, metal, right? Not something that won't fall apart if you actually need to use it. But don't do that. <laughs> and other legal things that you need to know about, right? Like I've been in countries where um, <clears throat> I was in this one Middle Eastern country once and I was hanging out with a girl that I met there and we're alone in the park at night. And um, I lean in to kiss her and she goes, what are you doing? They could be watching us. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? It's extremely illegal to kiss a girl in public, right? And so, like, obviously she knew that. But, like, if for whatever reason there was somebody watching and literally there was, like, a guy sitting over here at, you know, in the um in the thobe and the kofia, the the man dress and the head scarf thing, right? And uh, she's like, he could, be, he could be security. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> I would have never thought that, but it's true, right? And in those countries, like, that's the way it goes. So these types of things, like, you don't want to get deported. You don't want to get in trouble. You don't want to get arrested. And they they will, right? They they will do that to you. So you need to know about those things before you get there. Um, can you bring alcohol? No, a lot of places you can't bring alcohol. Can you bring any type of, like, you know, can your girlfriend bring her fucking little vibrator with it? Like, no. A lot of places they'll be in, trust me, I've been there. Like, that's they, that's a no. And they'll take it, and then they'll take your name, and it's bad. You don't want to draw any attention to yourself. A lot of these things that, like, again, Americans, Europeans, we might not think about, think about them, understand them, know them before you get there. Um, other, other considerations that we need to be aware of, there's a lot. And I'll go into details about them. Again, if I get enough interest in this video, I don't anticipate that because, again, this is not a very popular topic. It might be interesting to some of us who actually have been there or are thinking about doing things like this. But, you know, it's not. We do talk about this stuff because the channel is gutter fighting secrets, right? We hearken back to the days of the OSS and the SOE. And this is stuff that these people actually went through, right? So I talk about this stuff, not to mention the fact that we're all about maximizing your survivability. And uh, so this is important stuff that a lot of other channels don't talk about, but I have the experience, so I will talk about it. <clears throat> so there is... Other things we want to take into consideration a lot more. But again, um, I'm going to reserve a more detailed video for if I got enough requests. But I brought up the fact about <clears throat> blending into your environment when you don't blend in at all. And I know this is one cool thing that like a lot of people like to talk about blending in the gray man this and that you know very people love this shit and uh i always laugh because you know sometimes i see i see people walk around and like maybe they have like some tactical pants on but they have like a gray shirt <laughs> and like you know some like gray sunglasses and, like whatever right and they're they're sitting there like a shirt like this and they're like it's really an attire and i've got my 511 pants on you know i've got my gray backpack and like no one will ever know. <laughs> it's definitely not what you want to do, right? So, like, let me go in a little bit to some of my experience, how to blend in when you don't fucking blend in at all. Um, and I'm going to start from more of a state side or more of, like, a local. We're living in our own country type of thing, and maybe we want to survive, like, in a bad part of town or blend in, rather, in a bad part of town. Um, and then I'll give you some tips, like, more from what I know about – um in overseas like foreign ass places where you just like you're the only white face out there for miles around so um walking around in a bad part of town i mean generally speaking right like during the day in, in a bad part of town or really anywhere like you you're you're pretty safe like no one's as long as you're not like going into like a, a seedy bar or like somewhere where you really shouldn't be and like or like walking down like little back alleys and like kind of like if you're not an idiot, um, you're probably going to be OK, even though like people know you're not supposed to be there. And a lot of the times when people know you're not supposed to be there, like you're actually a little bit safer because like why 
think about it. Like, why would anyone want to fuck with an innocent person just trying to make their way through through a place, right? Like, there are people that will do that, but like a lot of the times, like you're almost in a weird way a little bit safer not being from there than than if you were during the day. Okay, during the day at night it'd be a little bit different. Um, <laughs> you might want to hurry your way up along, right? One thing that I can tell you from personal experience is acting like you're supposed to be there. Like just even if you don't know where the fuck you are and like you're lost, act like you know where the fuck you are and you're not lost. Like just have a walk about you, like have a good posture, keep your head up, like just act like I'm supposed to be here and I'm going to where I need to go and don't fuck with me. Don't get in my way. Like I might be like I might be a cop, dude. I might be official. Like and if you mess with me, like you're the bad shit's going to happen. Right. So like, don't mess with me. Um, and for someone of my uh, stature and the way I look and the haircut I have like that, that works. Right. Like it, um, it's, it, it's a good thing to simply like put your head up and act like I have important business I'm doing. Don't get in my way. I'm not going to mess with you, but certainly you should not mess with me. Like I'm, I know where I'm going and I'm going there. Leave me alone. That often has, per, for me, like worked very well. Uh, and that's one thing that I'll say is like, just that's that's worked very well. Like you'll hear people talk about like, don't wear this color if you're in this neighborhood. Like, yeah, sure, you probably shouldn't. But like, look at me. If I'm sitting around and I'm wearing a red shirt, dude, or like I've got a red on, right? Or like a blue, like, like I doubt anyone's going to ask me like what set I'm claiming, dude. Like, come on, like get the fuck, like. You know, and like I've had that happen where like I've had some red on and people like <laughs> the guy asked me like, hey, what's up, man? And I'm like, dude, <laughs> get the fuck out of here, bro. Like, come on. And then they, you know, he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, it really what it is, is is two things. Number one, acting like you're supposed to be there. You're a reason for being there. And like you're just going to where you need to go. And then number two is like what I just said, like be friendly, you know, like be be. I wouldn't say friendly is the word. Have a smile and be willing to joke around with people. Like if somebody starts hassling, you'd be like, what the fuck do you want, man? Like, get out of here, bro. Like, like leave me the, the get the fuck out of here, man. And like a lot of the times, if you can simply like treat a situation, if you're like in any way confronted by people and you kind of like laugh it off, like you're not a threat to me, like get out of here. A lot of the times they'll say, all right, all right, all right. And they'll just let you go on your way. So um, not being overly friendly, but like being being very much at ease um, with interacting with different types of personalities and having enough street smarts to know like how to talk to people will, will get you out of a lot of, a lot of shit. Right. So um, what about if you're in like a place where like, <laughs> what about you're, you're in like a bad part of the middle East, Africa, Asia, South America, right? Like what, how do you blend in when you're like, look like me? Well, you don't, you, you first thing is the most important thing is you know that like, look at me dude like look at these tattoos like look at this haircut bro like again people are going to have assumptions but they know you're definitely not supposed to be there or like not from there at least so um wearing especially if you have tattoos but like even if you don't like even if you don't do like a lot of the places in these hot countries like middle east india uh not so much, but certain parts of Asia that are like more Muslim, like people don't wear shorts, dude. Like they don't. They wear jeans and long pants even during the hot summers because it's always hot summer. Um, and they're used to it. So they'll wear long pants. Um, they'll wear long sleeves. Like they might roll their sleeve up slightly, but they will still wear like dress clothes, nice, like long sleeves. Um, identify what the baseline is in that area and dress like them. That way, from my experience, you're not trying to act like you're local uh, per se, but you would, in best case scenario, you want them to think that you're some type of expat where you are living over there. You're familiar with the environment. You probably have friends and connections. This is the best course of action that we, that, that we can, the best outcome that we can hope for. So <clears throat> dress as the locals dress. And if that means it's a hundred and something degrees out, but you're wearing jeans and long sleeves like I do, so be it. I have to hide these tattoos. I have no way around that, especially when I'm in certain countries in the Middle East. And this freaking tattoo is not welcome, dude. Like, I will definitely 
put on my like long sleeves. I will literally buy a long sleeve shirt over there. I have I have one experience where I was in a place, and uh, I walk out of the place I was staying. I was in a white t shirt and a pair of jeans, and the more I walked around, dude, like the more evident it was that like I was not welcome. So I popped into a little souk, and I found hanging up uh like a plaid. Red and blue plaid, like, uh, button down shirt. And I was like, give this to me. And I took it off the rack. I put it on and, um, I walked out. Like I paid for it. Obviously I overpaid for it actually. But in that case, I was like, whatever you want this much money, like, fuck you, take it. Um, and after that, I felt a lot more at ease. People were a lot more at ease because they couldn't see my tattoos. I had almost all of me covered. And it, I looked more like appropriate to be in that in that place. Um, and a lot less attention was brought to me after that. So doing things like this is absolutely essential. Some guys, and I'm talking specifically about, um, well, I'm talking more specifically about more Muslim-oriented places, but this is something to know for these days. Um, putting a thobe on, and when I say a thobe, I mean actually like, the man dress, uh, it's appropriate. Like you can do that. Um, and especially if you speak a little bit of language, like I do, it's very appropriate. And they're not going to make, they're not going to think you're weird for doing it. And I thought it was weird when at first, like when I first experienced this, I was like, well, would I wear this? But no, actually like some places they'll be like, oh, cool. Like that's our culture. Cool. Good shit. Um, and sometimes that's absolutely appropriate and you can do that. You can put on um, some of the local head garb too. Like you don't have to. A thobe is sometimes more than appropriate, but like things like that, right? Um, so the local customs. If you're in Pakistan, and I don't, I haven't spent any time in Pakistan, but like if you are in Pakistan and you put the local garb on, it's good. Like honestly, you're gonna want to do that, right? Um, that's just what you do. You dress like the locals, and you blend in. Well, more, more well, more better than you would otherwise looking like this, right? You don't go around. You don't, you don't take your tactical sunglasses. You do. You, do, you don't like, you buy a pair of like non-threatening looking fucking sunglasses. Um, so things like that. <laughs> and again, the outcome that we want is to have them think that we're at least an expat working over there, have connections, have friends, um, and they probably won't mess with you. Grow your beard out, uh, like I've done, and um, it's good to go. So. Those are just a few pointers from, you know, from, from what I've experienced and uh, anyone out there with other experience, hey, throw it down in the comments below. I appreciate you watching. Next Warrior Wednesday, we'll probably get back to discussing some of the more um, philosophical points of you know, warrior philosophy and stuff like that, uh, if that's what you guys want. If you want more stuff like this, let me know in the comments. I tailor these videos to what the audience uh, desires. Until next time, please remember that you are your first and last line of defense. Comment, like, subscribe, and share. Drive us up in the algorithm so that we can reach more orange. All right, guys, stay safe out there. I'll see you in the next video. Cheers, my friends.